We got to let those who are who are still on the outside get in. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'll accept that. I, I really, really tempted to ask good evening to everyone else, but hey, we're gonna uh, just here in a moment. We're gonna sing some songs and just you know prepare our hearts and our souls for communion, and uh, we're gonna read Psalm or not Psalm. I read Psalms a lot. Um, Isaiah 53, and I'll just, you know, pull out some things about what our Savior has done for us. And then we'll have a time of communion, and then we'll close with a song together. But it's just to help us to, to remember what this is about. We don't celebrate a calendar. It's not a date, right? But we do take time out of our year to acknowledge this moment in history. Uh, so with that in mind, if you just bow your heads with me, I want to open us in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor to assemble together. Uh, to call upon your great name, to worship you. Father, we are here uh, this evening uh, simply to acknowledge that this moment in history that is profound and life-changing, it is so important. Our words fail to express um, what you've done for us, Lord, at, at, at Calvary. Um, Lord, we're so grateful and so thankful for salvation. We know we can't earn it. We know we can't deserve it. And yet, because of who you are, of your own attributes and character and your own name, as you express yourself in your word and show us who you are, we realize because you are love, and you so loved us, you sent your son, who paid just a, a horrific price on that cross. Your wrath poured out on him. It's deserved to us, but he took it. Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us this way. Thank you for the hope of salvation, redemption. Thank you, Lord, that you are good all the time, that you began a good work in us. And it's knowing Jesus. And you brought us to Calvary. And, Lord, tonight we, we, we just simply want to come to the foot of the cross and say thank you. We want to worship you and praise you. So we just simply ask, God, that your spirit would be amongst us, that you would... Um, Lord, be glorified in our praises and in time of communion as we look at your word. Draw us closer, Father, ever so closer to you, that we would have confidence in you, that we would know you, that we'd have that wonderful, blessed assurance of what Christ has done. So, Lord, uh, be with us. We commit this time to you, and we ask your, uh, Lord, just your activity. Um, stir us and draw us, and we pray all this for your glory. And in the mighty name the awesome name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you would, uh, would you stand with us? We're going to begin by singing uh, a song. I hope it's not new. It might be, but it's just simply called Once Again. Upon your sacrifice, you became nothing. Lord, out to death many times. I wondered at your gift of me. I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. Once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside and Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life Now you are Exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens. One day I'll bow, but for now, I marvel at this saving grace, mindful of praise once again. Mindful of praise 
once again. Once again I look upon the cross where you by your mercy and I'm broken inside once again I thank you once again I pour out my life let's sing thank you for the cross 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 Lord, thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, once again I look upon the cross where you died, I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. Sing that again. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds and by his wounds we are here we are here by your sacrifice in the life that you give we are here for you paid the price by your grace we are saved we are saved it was peace for our transgressions it was crushed for our sins punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds, by his wounds we are Yes. 
sing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the blood that makes me white as oh no standing, I'll read through Isaiah 53. It's a very familiar passage, I would imagine, if you've ever been to uh, a Good Friday service or goodness, just come across the gospel. There are reasons why Isaiah is, is referred to as the fifth gospel, and this is, this is one of them. Isaiah 53, he says, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as the root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he has cut off, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he has done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Before we have a time of communion, I just thought it would be good for us to just simply read this chapter from Isaiah and focus upon the kind of Savior, right, that we need and what our sin demands. You know, as we think about the cross and as we've... Um, Think about this profound moment, right, of Calvary and what Christ has gone through. And if you're familiar with the Gospels and the cross and the rejection, everything that he has uh, has gone through. And and just here in this chapter alone, we realize how great our sin must be that a Savior would endure uh, such affliction, uh, such sorrow. I mean, the, the words, the adjectives described here, this picture that Isaiah seems to have a front row seat, even though he's writing 700 years before this moment in history. Uh, He sees it all, but for us this morning, we are this evening, right? Uh, This evening, we have to realize that this is, this moment was for you and me. It's not as if there's another way to redemption, this is it. And Christ going to uh, to Calvary, going to Golgotha, the Mount of the Skull, this is This is what it takes. And so we realize the kind of Savior that we need, that we we come to this moment and we receive salvation. It's for us, uh, but it's also because of us. Uh, You and I are equal in our sin problem. And this Savior who knew no sin took that upon himself. So quickly, Lord willing, right, we'll look at this passage and A few things I'd like to point out, the kind of Savior that the Lord provides for us. And the first one I would like to just point to you, there's no notes, but just keep your Bible open to this passage. And the first three verses, we see that we need a sorrowful Savior. Imagine many times we've heard the man of sorrows, right? It's songs written about that. And Jesus, when he comes, not only here, right, and of course in the Gospels and even in our own time, our own culture, there is is a lack of acknowledgement. There's a lack of understanding of who he is. John says in John 1, 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Isaiah begins this verse 1 of this chapter, who has believed our report? In Isaiah's day, they look upon and think upon this person as Isaiah is writing about this future event as one we see he's in front of us. He's a man of sorrows, but we don't desire him. We don't want him. In Jesus' day is what John is saying. There are those who did not receive him, even though he came to them. We see this even at the moment of the triumphal entry, right, where Jesus comes into Jerusalem and and Excuse me, a few short days we see the crowd go from Hosanna to crucify. John also says in John 12 38, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. 
that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? See, what the world sees today and what they saw at that time was a sorrowful servant, someone being punished, someone being judged by God. And and we come as as redeemed children and we see a, a sorrowful Savior, rejected by the world. Nothing about him that makes us go, this is our Savior, this is who he is. The ordinary moment of Calvary in their day, it's just another moment where someone's being nailed to a cross and yet... While this is happening, the Lord is redeeming his children. This is why I believe Isaiah says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He tells us that we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. I think it's very important for us to realize that Christ has come, and he was a sorrowful, a man of sorrows. He took upon himself, and it's important for us to understand that it's not the judgment of God upon him, yet he is becoming a substitute. And this is what Isaiah says in verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, Isaiah unfolds for us this man of sorrows. He's not just going through this because there's judgment of God upon him, right? The world misunderstands and says this person did something wrong and yet it's our sin, right? This man of sorrows, but he explains it. This man of sorrows deals with our sorrows. He's a substitutionary savior. We esteemed him, right? As Isaiah says, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Right? Not for us, Right? or excuse me, for himself, but for us. There was a story of an artist who uh, was working on painting a young girl, and he asked this young girl to come in and and to be a model for him as he did his artwork, and she noticed that he had been working on another painting. It was a painting of Christ on the cross. And her assessment of this painting, knowing nothing of it, she said to the painter, he must have been a wicked man. To die in such a horrible way. And the painter quite quickly responded and said, Oh, absolutely not. He was a very good man, paying for the price of others. And see, this is what Isaiah is simply saying. You look at the, the passage, he says, It's our griefs, not his. It's our sorrows, it's our transgressions, it's our iniquities. And what do we get out of it? His peace, right? He adds the chastisement of our peace was on him. The servant is not being punished as the little girl thought. but He was a man of sorrows for us. He's making peace as a mediator for us. He was a substitute. What's interesting out of that story is the little girl, as she received that information, the painter explained it to her. She responded in saying, well, did he die for your sins, which caught the painter off guard. He wasn't quite ready for that, and he couldn't quite answer it. It was until later as he contemplated and prayed about it, thought about this moment in history where a man of sorrows, did he take my sin? Why is this important? I mean, you think of the Calvary, and I know it's, it's Good Friday. Typically, this service is, is people who know what has taken place at the Calvary, right? We come and we worship. And we say, this is our God. This is our Savior. This is what he's done. But Isaiah says these words because each and every one of us have gone astray, right? Verse 6, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned away. And this is where we see the purpose of the cross.
this is how we understand what's taking place, right? The magnitude of it. We understand our sin. We understand our desire. We understand that our heart wants to go its own direction. And yet while we are doing this, God is saving us. The story of D.L. Moody who was speaking at, a, at an event and he had to run quickly afterwards and he had to catch his train to be at another place in which to speak and uh, a person followed him out as he was running to catch the train and uh, the person needed his attention and said, what do I do? You know, how do I get saved? What is this whole thing about? And D.L. Moody couldn't miss the train. He simply responded and said, go to Isaiah 53, 6. He said, read that verse. And on the first all, he says, go in. And on the last all, he says, go out. And he goes off, grabs his train and leaves. The gentleman perplexed at this goes quickly to his Bible and reads Isaiah verse 6, which says all, right? This is where D.L. Moody said, go in. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're simply saying, go in with the, you have gone astray, you have sinned. But through prayer, right, through the acknowledgement of Christ, see yourself in the last all. See, this is the Savior we need. He's the Savior who is sorrowful. He's the Savior who is a substitute. Isaiah continues to unfold this for us. He's a Savior that was silent and slaughtered. Verses 7 and 9. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. The transgressions of my people, he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Here is the silent, right, ultimately slaughtered Savior that you and I need. This shows us the magnitude of our sin. The silence epitomizes, right, his meekness, his humbleness as a Savior. He spoke not. Even in the gospel accounts, he never spoke, right, to defend himself. It was only when uh, the Sadducees and the elders uh, called upon him under oath, right, by God you will speak. It's only then where Jesus spoke to them. We know going into Jerusalem, he provokes, right, this moment. He knows where he's going. The time has come. Right? The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. This is what is unfolding. And Isaiah is writing it out for us. But there's no redemption. There's no forgiveness of sin unless there is a sacrifice. Unless he is slaughtered. This is the Father's will. We know in the garden Jesus prayed, not my will, your will. What is the Father's will for Jesus' life? Right? To pay for our sins cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. This is why he was bruised. We see also this moment, verse 9, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. It's interesting as we see the plural, wicked is plural, and yet the rich is singular. And here, when Isaiah is writing this, it probably doesn't make sense, but us looking back on Calvary and then looking back on Isaiah, we can go, I know exactly what he's talking about. Jesus went before Pilate, right? He went before a crowd. There were many who, who yelled and, and cursed at him. When he, even when he was on the cross, there are those who yelled, crucify him. There were thieves, right? Even one who said, this is, you know, save yourself, Jesus. Yeah, there's a plural wicked all over the place. And yet there's a singular, there's one man who's mentioned, Joseph of Arimathea, right? Who was told, right? We are told. He was a rich man who gets the body of Jesus. You know, it's interesting as you think about our life, right? Our sins, our redemption, the price Jesus paid. And yet 
this is the only way, right? Jesus is correct when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Outside of this moment, outside of, of this sacrifice, there is no hope, right? The full curse of the law is upon us. That's why Paul says he took the curse for us. And yet how often, I imagine you've heard this, maybe in a time in your life you thought this, how often is our response is to say, you know what, when my life comes to an end, I'm going to be all right. I don't know Jesus, but I'm not sure if I need him. I'm, gonna, I'm pretty good. I'm going to make it, right? There's a story of sometime back, 60 Minutes. Dan Rather interviewed a person by the name of Jack Welch. Uh, at that time, he was um, the CEO of General Electric, and he asked this question of him. He said, uh, what's the toughest question you've ever been asked? And his response was, do you think you'll go to heaven? So when he asked the answer of this, Dan Rather said, well, how would you answer that question? Here's his response. Well, it's a long answer, but I said that if caring about people, if giving it your all, if being a, a great friend counts, despite the fact that I've been divorced a couple of times and no one's really proud of that. I haven't done everything right all the time, but I think I've got a shot. I'm in no hurry to get there and in really no hurry to find out anytime soon. Right? But that's one of many, right? We, we could add a lot to that. But think about this, what Isaiah is saying. I mean, here is the world that says, I think I've got a shot. And yet, Isaiah, of course, the Gospels, the, at the moment of Calvary is saying, you know, he had to be slaughtered. There had to be atonement. Only a slaughtered Savior can save. So Isaiah walks us through. He was a sorrowful, right? A man of sorrows. He was a substitution. He was slaughtered. And lastly, the last uh, three verses here, 10 through 12, I simply say we need a, a Savior who is victorious. There's this profound verse, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here we see the satisfaction made. We see the justification come to life. We see that it pleased, pleased the Lord to bruise him and put this upon him. But he also speaks as the victory that is going to take place. He will be satisfied. He will justify many. He will complete this. 700 years before this moment in history, Isaiah is telling him, here it is. Not only is he going to be a man of sorrows and a substitute, he's going to be slaughtered. He will be victorious. He will overcome the grave. Today as a New Testament church, we have that truth, right? We understand this. It is the wisdom of God and it's opposite the world. I love how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 25. He says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. We see that all over the place. Did not know God, but it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men opposite the world. Right? Christ has told us, I have overcome the world. Take heart, John 16, right? Take heart, I have overcome the world. Christ has become our mediator between God and men. He has accomplished this work. 
1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Christ is also the last Adam. Everyone's born into the first Adam, but he is the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, And so it is written, the first, uh, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. He completes the work. We also know, and just what I've been saying, Christ is victorious. Romans 4, 25, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. This is the man of sorrows who was a substitute, who was slaughtered, becomes victorious. But in order to get there, right, he must go through the cross. It's amazing what our Savior has done and what he has gone through. Not opening his mouth, I can imagine the insults and all the things being said and how our flesh would want to respond, right, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Yet he quietly goes, just as the word says. And if you think about it, he was the bread of life, right? He who was or is the bread of life began his ministry hungry. He who was the water of life ended his ministry thirsting. Christ hungered as man, yet he fed the hungry. He was weary, and yet he is our rest. He paid tri tribute, and yet he is the king. He was called a devil, yet he casts out devils. He prayed, and yet he hears our prayers. He wept, and he dries our tears. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeems the world. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and yet he is the good shepherd. He died, he gave his life, and by dying he destroys death. This is the cost of our sin. This is what our Savior has done. He was a man of sorrows, but he overcame the world. As we prepare ourselves for communion, it's, it's understanding Isaiah 53 in the context of what is happening when Jesus tells his disciples, giving us instruction for communion. Thinking of Isaiah 53, think of now of that and, and, and listen to this. He says, Paul tells us, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. But the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given things, he broke it and said, Think of all of Isaiah 53, he says, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. The new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we think about our sin, we think about this moment, we think about all that Isaiah says, and here Jesus is giving communion. One has already uh, betrayed him. The rest are going to scatter here in a moment. He's going to go to the garden. They can't even stay awake and pray with him. This is where he's heading. He knows all of this, and yet he is Lord over it. But he is being led as a lamb to the slaughter. And without that moment, you and I have no chance or hope of forgiveness. This is a good Friday, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. I know many of us at times, and we can't even think, we can't even love ourselves. Lord, we think of the mistakes and the problems and the issues, and then we project that upon you, and we think there's no way you could love us. God, forgive us of that thought. In those moments, clearly, Lord, we have not gone to Calvary. We have not stood at the foot of the cross and looked upon our Savior and stand there in that moment and listen to the jeers of the world that are yelling upon him, that see him as being judged by you 
because he did something wrong and not realizing that he's pouring out, you're pouring out your wrath upon him that we would be redeemed. He took our sorrows. We don't realize, Lord, that in this moment he's being our substitute. No one can stand before you. You are a holy God. No one stands in your presence. No one can exist or live in your presence. And yet by this moment, we have access into your throne room of grace. He's our substitute. And Lord, we know there can be no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And so we know this silent lamb must be slaughtered. We realize it is for us because of us. It is our sin. Lord, we thank you that Isaiah understood this. He understood all of this and he wrote it for us 700 years before all this takes place. And we know that our Savior was victorious. He has justified many. So Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for this time of communion that we can just simply, Lord, worship you and, and acknowledge you and say thank you. Because this great exchange, Lord, we, we receive everything. We give you our sin and our shame and our sorrows. And yet we get salvation and fellowship with you. Lord, thank you. I pray that as we, Lord, take communion now, that we would have that right heart, a heart of reverence or confessing our sins. We do, we confess them now. Lord, cleanse us that we can just have right fellowship, commune with you, hear your voice. And I pray, Lord, for maybe some of us this evening are going through difficult times. Bring us back to Calvary. Let us realize what you went through to redeem us. And Father, help us to never doubt your love again. Let it be a wonderful, powerful motivator to live a holy and godly life in all that we do. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. We're going to have a time of communion now, so I invite just a few men who come up and help us hand these, these elements out. Um, don't have to be a member of the church to take communion. You need to be a believer, right? And understand what this is all about. So hold on to the elements. We'll take them together. And, and um, I think that's enough, yeah.
to Jesus' instructions, he says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Thank you, man. You can be seated. Thought it would be fitting to kind of bring our time to a close as we think about the events of of this weekend so many years ago. But if you would grab your hymnal, I'd like us to just close in a, with a hymn. And the one I'd like us to sing is Jesus Paid It All on page, excuse me, hymn number 210. Two ten. I think it would be good if we all stood. Let's all stand and let's sing this together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all and all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find. Thy power and thine alone can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to them I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. And Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And everyone said, Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you, prepare you for Sunday as well. We'll look forward to that day together. You are dismissed.